Psalm 27, 4, one thing I have asked of the Lord that I will seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. All right, if you could ask the Lord one thing, what would you ask? It's kind of a big question because, you know, if you're having financial problems, you'd be like, oh, help me out, Lord, to get through. If you were having relational issues, you would want to get, Charlotte, close that door, please, behind you. You'd want to ask for, you know, God to bring some counseling into your world. Um, Maybe you have some dreams that you have yet to experience, that you'd like to experience, okay? Some form of happiness, maybe, career success, I don't, I don't know, longer life. The older I get, and the more aches and pains that seem to come, I'm like, well, you know, this longer life is, I guess it's a gift. But um, there's a lot of beautiful aspects to life. Let's be honest, okay? Um, The friends that I went to Beverly Hills Hotel with, these guys travel all over the world every year, three or four times a year. So they go to high-end places and, you know, exotic destinations four times a year. And they stay a while. So, you know, it's the life that we all would like to lead, some of you have been to some really fun places. You know, when you make travel part of your, your destination, your, your part of your life, it's fun. Um, but, but I know that sometimes just being in, at the beach and watching the sunrise or the sunset, you know, I'll take pictures. They're, they can be stunning. Um, the emotional explosion when your child was born or your grandchild, okay? I got friends who love to tell me about their grandchildren. (laughs) And I remind him what Winston Churchill said. Somebody asked him, have I told you about my grandchild? And he said, no, and I want to thank you. (laughs) Okay? It's amazing when a child enters into your world, and that little one belongs to you. And so what I'm talking about is heart moments. And and, and David says, one thing I've asked of the Lord that I'm going to seek after. I'm not only asking, I'm going to ask in pursuit that I'll dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to behold the beauty of the Lord and inquire of his temple, in his temple. I just have to tell you, um, i was been rolling through the Bible and there's invitations to inquire. Say, Lord, how come this is going on? Lord, I don't understand. Lord, would you explain? Lord, would you guide me? Lord, and, and I just really believe that this is an overlooked benefit that you have in your relationship with God to ask. I was in L.A., he spoke to me, and I didn't even figure it out until I got back, okay? And, 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 you know, maybe he speaks to the inside of our minds, or maybe he speaks right out of the Bible, or maybe he speaks through another Christian friend. Maybe you hear an audible voice. Maybe it's an impression. Whatever it is, you asked, he answers, okay? And... I think when you anticipate the answer, that's what's called faith, and faith gets God excited, and there's more intentionality. Oh, I just wish I could understand this problem someday. Uh, That's a little too vague. Lord, can you help me solve this problem, because I'd like to be able to be used by you in this situation. Well, now there's some teeth to the statement. But he wants, to, he wants to see the Lord. And I, I want you to notice the single-minded purpose of mind and heart. 
that I can dwell in the house of the Lord. I'm going to pursue it. I want to see your beauty. I want to talk to you. And um, gazing upon the face of the Lord. And, and gazing, have you ever gazed? You know, there's the quick glance. Oh, this is good. When Lot's wife turned towards Sodom, it wasn't a quick little peek. She, the, the Hebrew word means she turned longingly for the place God was destroyed. If God's shutting that down, that means pretty much need to be leaving that place alone. She's longing for what God said no. She was gazing, okay? And, and gazing with our eyes, it's to have intensity, to have delight, to have pleasure in. Do you delight in the Lord? Do you have pleasure in the Lord? Now, sometimes things go wrong, and you got an attitude with the Lord. And he's a big boy. He can handle it. But I, I think when you get into the relationship with him, you can go, oh, man, I don't like this, but I'm with you anyways, and you keep moving. And you find real other reasons to delight in him. Okay? And really, what you gaze at is going to impact your life. When Peter was gazing at Jesus, he walked on the water. When he took his eyes off of Jesus and onto the storm, he sank. Jehoshaphat has an army, a confederation of armies coming after him. We don't know what to do, but our eyes are on you. It's a good result there. Jehoshaphat 2020. 2020 vision, all right? Um, God said, you will see the deliverance of the Lord when your eyes are on him. And, and so David knew what we spend our time gazing upon is going to determine the outcome of our lives. Um, he gazed at Bathsheba too long, and that was a bad outcome. It was a very bad outcome for him, all right? Um, I think, you know, as you're going through the spiritual journey, you kind of figure out, okay, like Job, you know, I do not gaze at a, a young virgin. He's just like, I don't, I'm not checking out the chicks. I am focused on my life, my Lord, my calling. I'm not being distracted, gazing where I shouldn't be looking, okay? Um, you know, for David, he's gazed at Bathsheba, which turned into adultery, which turned into murder, which turned into the death of a child, which turned into um, a host of problems for David, his own son being killed. So sometimes you can open up a door that's all bad. And you just have to be in awe of God. God is the one punishing him when his son... Is, is Absalom is pursuing him, and yet the forest killed more than David's men. God protected him, still, even though God was the one punishing him. You just have to like your God. And what does David write after the Bathsheba? Psalm 51, the psalm about forgiveness. And I think all of us need forgiveness. It's a good psalm. And you don't get to that psalm without having gone through some failures and some flaws. So, raises the question, what is the overriding passion of your life? Okay, where do you direct your gaze? Because uh, it's going to determine where your heart is. What's most important to you? Now, the fact that you're here with me today means that you are gazing at the Lord. That's why you've come, to gaze into His Word and to get a peek at who He is. Um, <clears throat> this is what Jesus says in the Beatitudes. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. So, pure in heart. Well, that disqualifies me. You go, wait a minute, before you disqualify yourself... You know, we think in terms of religion. You know, if I do this and I don't do that, then I'll have a pure heart. 
But no, a heart is different than um, behavior modification and sin management. The heart is your passion. Okay, it's not an external thing. Um, I, I'm going to tell you something kind of weird. We've been told that God, you know, doesn't like sinners. And if you want to see God move in your life, then the first thing you better do is adjust the sin in your life. Well, I remember I met Jesus and I was a young man living in Los Angeles and I was falling in love with Jesus and I still had some unsurrendered areas. And what was, I didn't know any better, but um, I was seeing lots of miracles. I was having lots of God experiences. I was truly beginning this incredible journey with the Lord. And now if you would have talked to my Baptist friends, they would have said, no, 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 no. First you got to, you know, stop this, start that, quit the other, you know, make this adjustment. And then... And, you know, I just got lost in my relationship with God, and he sorted it out. Believe me, there comes a moment when he squeezes you, and he gets rid of the stuff he doesn't want on you anymore. All right? But I want you to know something. The squeeze is the safest place to be because he has a grip on you that will never let go. All right? It's kind of beautiful. Well, um... I guess what I'm telling you is the Lord is interested in people who are still struggling. So in case you have something going on in your life, some pattern of thinking, whatever it might be, maybe you only tithe 9% instead of 10%, okay? That's a big sin, but we can, we can work with that, all right? Um, a little bit of a joke there, relax. Um, here's the deal. It's about your heart's inclination. And Jesus says, I do not desire sacrifice, but compassion. The Lord, he's after your heart. Um, remember when the, Jesus was talking about the religious people saying, didn't we cast out demons and heal the sick and prophesy in your name and do all these miracles? And Jesus said, I never knew you. See, there's something from the heart that's required in order to be in step with the Lord. He wants the core of you. And, and so uh, here's what a pure heart means. A pure heart is no longer struggling to decide where it will give its loyalty. Okay? And it's not just I acknowledge that there is a God. No, it's a soul that loves God and misses God when you haven't been in his presence for a while. I remember a few months ago, I was waking up in the middle of the night, and my thoughts were going here, and they usually go to him. And then I, I noticed, I go, look at this. I'm losing my first love because I'm thinking about that in the middle of the night. And he kind of let me know, hey, what happened to that 2, 3, 4 o'clock in the morning conversation we used to have? And I explained to him I was trying to sleep, but anyways... Um, Here's the deal. Um, when things don't go your way. Ah, I was hoping. Or this one really hurts to lose my spouse. Or to have this collapse occur in my life. But you know what? I'm on a journey with you, God. And you're stuck with him. You stick with him. You like him. You're comfortable with him to argue a little bit. But... um. Kind of like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He will save me. And even if he doesn't, not worshiping Nebuchadnezzar's idol. And, and, and this is important because remember in Revelation chapter 3 where he says, listen, I wish you were hot or cold. But because you're lukewarm, bleh, I'm going to spit you out of my mouth. There's an angle of being hot with God. I mentioned this in my morning video I got some people in my life that they don't, they're not like us who come to church. You know, I don't think they even own a Bible, and if they do, I'm sure they haven't read it. But somehow they live 
with a mind towards God, and I watch God bless them and answer their prayers. And they're grateful. Not the kind of grateful you and I would be, okay, with the 8% tithe, okay, but they're grateful in the sense that they acknowledge, I asked, God answered, I'm being blessed, okay? And um, for me, I'm like, wow, you're missing out what's available to you. You could have God every morning. You, he would move through you in powerful ways if you allowed it to happen. He would heal the brokenness of your heart. So many things could happen that don't happen because you don't meet with God. So, so what does gazing and desiring and beholding require? What, what's required to gaze and behold and desire God? I think it's the desire to stay in communion with Him. So I'm going to say 10 years ago, I got tired of... Did I have a quiet time this week? Boy, I feel like I haven't opened the Bible in four days. So I decided one September 1st, I'm not going to miss a Bible reading for the rest of the year. And I think I missed three that year. And every, every September 1 to September 1 for the last decade, I try to read the Bible every day of the week. I've gone 361 and 4, 365 and 0, 364 and 1. I don't think I've ever missed more than five days. One day, my daughter took my Bible from my bedside. It took me four days to figure it out. I'm like, oh, man, I can't miss another day for the rest of the year. But, um, and, and it's not that I have to do it. It's that I had made a decision that I like to do it, that I long to do it, that I need to have this discipline in my life, that I want to meet with the Lord. And even yesterday, I got all choked up when when Jacob was saying, Lord, I'm afraid. I'm afraid of Esau. Because I remember when I've been afraid a few times, and you go into the presence, and it's such a raw emotion, okay? It's when you make the decision that I want to be in constant communication with God. I want to stay in constant connection to God, constant communion with God, whether I'm in church Sunday or in my private life. And, and we do this with our devotional life. And I, and I want you to know something. You know, the God of the Old Testament, I, I don't like that guy, but I like the God of the New Testament. When you get in touch with grace in the New Testament, you're going to see it just fills the Old Testament, the grace of God. He gets a little rough with the people that are worshiping idols and sacrificing their children into the fire and having, you know, sexual orgies two other gods. I mean, yeah, every now and then he gets a little judgmental, pretty judgmental in Jeremiah because he's about to remove the nation for 70 years. And he's warning them. But I just want you to know how much God puts up with before those judgment verses come out of his mouth. All right? Well, I want you to know something else. You and I, I don't know who your Christian is that you interact with, but you should have one, or two, or some. You should have somebody that you bounce things off of. I have a professional theologian at home, my wife, okay? She's smart. She's so incredibly deep, and, um, you know, I, I'm able to go to her and, and get sound advice, whatever it is. But, but I, I think all of us, we need to watch out for one another and encourage one another and lift out one another up. How about this? Dust each other off when we fall. Now, what do we normally do when somebody falls? Well, um, good luck with that. Okay. Um, but no, somebody falls, we need to come alongside them and say, well, yeah, this one's my friend. <laughs> I like him, I love him, made a mistake, and I'm going to help him get through it. Now that's Christian love. That's a good friend. That's the way we're supposed to live. And, and this mindset that I'm talking about, this gazing after God, this longing for God, 
it, 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 it's, it's watchful. There's a constant vigilness. Are you aware of where you're weak? Because when you are, you'll make adjustments. Nope, can't go out with that person on Friday nights. Nope, not going to buy my, my books at that store. Nope, going to make, you just start to make adjustments. Or how about just a simple one? I know that I'm going to meet with the Lord at five in the morning. So, you know, I'd like to go to the concert with you, but I'm not going to get home till one. And I would rather meet with the Lord at five in the morning than go to the Deep Purple concert and get home at one in the morning. And I like Deep Purple, or I used to, okay? This is a real live situation in my life a couple weeks ago. I didn't want to go to the concert because I didn't want to miss my devotional life. Besides, it was only one of the original members, okay? But what I'm saying is you start to make decisions that prioritize your relationship with God. That's all I'm trying to say. You never want to get to neutral. And we, you know, you do drift into neutral. All of us drift into neutral. I drift into neutral. You know, I remember recently I found myself in neutral. I'm like, how did this happen to me? I was in such a wonderful groove with God. So you can spend a lot of time worrying about that, or you can just immediately get back in the, the zone, find your way back in. Okay? And you do that, and it works, and it's beautiful, and everything's good. I love this passage in Philippians 2. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For God is at work in you. Now what does it mean, work out? I think work out the implications. Sometimes I... Well, maybe I need to reconsider what I just said. Okay? <laughs> Sometimes you have to give yourself a talking to. You have to measure yourself against what the promises of God are. A fear, a fear is a great one. Why am I fearing when he's always being faithful? Why am I doubting when he has a perfect record of operating in my life? And so you got to work out your salvation and fear and trembling, Jesus went to the cross for you. How about this? It's insulting to the Lord that you would fall into worry after all he's done for you. And I'm a little bit of a worrier. So for us worriers, we got to kind of take that seriously. I need to put some faith into this. God's involved. And he's expecting a little bit more from some of us who've been walking with him for 30, 40 years. Like I said to my friend on Sunday, sermon, you're still asking me about Mary Magdalene and Jesus in a romantic relationship? I mean, you should be so far in a different place spiritually than wondering about that. We already talked about it, and if you think that, then you should look it up. And put that to rest. I mean, think about this. Yeah, God came and thought he'd have a little, you know, fling while he was here on earth, right? No. God came to earth to save the world from sin. He didn't, he didn't come to, for his own pleasures. He came to experience, you know, what you and I have had to deal with. So, friends... If my friend would have put in the extra, he would experience the extraordinary. And I want you to put in the extra, the extra homework, the extra time. How many people? Oh, I wish I could just get a different outcome. Well, have you logged some time in his presence in prayer? Do you, have you got your knee pads out? Have you begged and asked and bargained and pleaded and, you know, Work this out with Jesus, whatever it is. Maybe it's somebody's soul. Maybe it's a circumstance you'd like to change. The extra effort leads to the extraordinary. And by the way, extra with God turns into supernatural. Well, I love this passage in 
Joshua 3, 5. Consecrate yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord is going to do wonders among you. Whew. I should put that up every Saturday. <laughs> you know, consecrate yourself. Let, let me make sure that my mind is in the right place, that I got my, my focus clear, that I'm anticipating and expecting God's going to show up. Because if I think he's going to show up and he does show up, something cool is going to happen. Well, a heart that's open to the Holy Spirit what it'll, what it'll do is it'll, it'll change the wrong attitudes that we have. I love this passage in Isaiah 30, 21. Your ears will hear a word behind you. This is the way. Walk in it. Whenever you turn to the right or to the left. I want you to feel the intimacy that God likes to have with us. The personalness. You know, Moses met with God face to face as a man speaks to his friends. Now, get a load of this. This is Exodus 33. I think it was Exodus 32 where God says, you can't see me and live. You can only see my back side. What happened? Well, Moses wanted to see him. And so God said, well, if you want to hang out with me, all right. It's kind of like, Remember uh, that movie, Oh God, John Denver, George Burns? And he goes, so God is a guy with a baseball cap and a plaid shirt? And he goes, oh, if I showed you my, who I was, you wouldn't be able to, you know, handle the splendor. No. God, he meets us. He speaks to us. You know. But, but I love this passage in Jeremiah. You'll no longer... Show, I'll no longer show you my back. I'll show you my face. And guys, I just want, I want you to feel this with me. Remember I said I drifted and I found myself like, well, I used to be close to the Lord and now I feel like I've drifted a little bit. And so I wanted to step back in, but it wasn't as easy as just opening up the Bible and stepping back in. No, I had to work for it. I had to claw my way back in. I had to... Um, I had to put the extra energy, the extra effort, and it paid off. And that's all I'm saying. Um, remember, God has feelings. God loves you in just the most fantastic way. You're forgiven. You're covered. He's going to bless you. But to step into where you're gazing at him... And, in, and desiring him and enjoying him, sometimes it takes a little extra effort. That's all I want you to know. And you will then see his, right here. Oh, hi, Who lets the dog out? He's going to see Richard. He likes Richard. All right, how about this? Let me have them. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> it's a dog's life around here, okay. Yes, he's the church dog. The church dog. He's the church dog. So I just want you to feel this. If you feel like you're only getting a glimpse at God's back, he loves you. He's answering your prayer. He's showing you his goodness. But what was it that separated David from everybody else? He had, a, you know, a man after God's own heart. And that's where we're supposed to get. Not that I get my prayers answered. Not that I get the blessings. Not, no, that you, like Moses wanted God, like David wanted God. And I think, the Holy Spirit available to us means God has made himself that close to us. Okay? 
And, and I want you to know that this isn't my opinion. God changed the dynamics between himself and humanity because when Jesus died on the cross, remember the, the big, thick curtain was cut in half? I mean, this is like four feet thick and 30 feet huge, and there was no way you could cut that in half. But God split it because he wanted us and him to be close. He wanted there to be no more separation between you and him. So what I'm saying is, I don't want you settling on separation. I want you to go home and say, you know, I feel like I'm going to have to do what pastor did and claw my way a, bit, a little bit closer. I'm going to decide to have my devotionals. I'm going to bullet point out some prayer life every day. I want more of God. How is he not going to answer that prayer? Okay. Well, let me speed past a few things here. Um, sometimes when you and I forgive others, and that's where life is hard and that's difficult, that's really when you're most like the nature of God. When you are willing to put yourself aside to bless somebody. Remember, the, the sheep and the goats, what's the difference? When do we see you hungry and thirsty and in need? When Jesus says, whenever you did it to the least of them, you were taking care of me. When you care about, when you see the world around you, the people, through the lens of God's heart, you're going to act differently towards them. You're going to invest in them. You're going to participate in solving their problems. All of this happens when you have that heart after God. Mother Teresa, she told the nuns, treat people on the streets of Calcutta with the tender care as if you were touching Jesus. Wow. Well, I don't know if he's happy about what I'm saying, you know, but, you know. Could you imagine just... Treating people like they were Jesus. They'd probably start acting like Jesus. Okay? I was on Facebook and this one quarterback was saying, this particular coach told me that I'm not worthy and that I'm going to have to earn it and maybe I'll be able to make it. And the other coach said, well... Man, you are really skilled and gifted, and I'm going to utilize your talent, and we're going to win some championships. He goes, which coach do you think I like better? Which one is most effective in my life? And so what I'd like to say is, if we started treating people the way Mother Teresa told us to treat the struggling, seeing the image of God in them, friends, you're going to start to see God. And they're going to start to see God. And you're going to activate Psalm 27 4. Okay? I want you to have some personal experiences with them. I do. So, if you're tired of living off of my personal experiences, it's time for you to have your own. Remember, you know, in Psalm 103, it says, God made his ways known to Moses and his acts to the sons of Israel. The Israelites saw the acts of God, but Moses got to know the nature and character of God. That's what I want you to go for. All right? So, how do we do this? Well, it's not really something that you do. It's a disposition of the heart. And it comes down to this. So I need to sit down and say, do I really want to have a closer relationship with God? I like the arrangement right now. I get blessed, I'm covered, and I got to deal with some stuff. But for the most part, God's not interfering with my life too much. Or you could say, you know what? I've lived long enough to know that if this is all there is, I wouldn't mind having the ultimate, and that's a relationship with God. 
That means sometimes you have to be humble in your prayer life and go, Lord, I, I feel like I found some character flaws that have been hiding. I feel like I need to go ask somebody forgiveness. I feel like I need to change my attitude, my communication pattern, my life. Would you help me, Holy Spirit? And the reason I want to make these changes is so I can have more of you. Because I'm getting in the way. I believe when you pray that way, something's going to happen. David, I remember you on my bed. In other words, his mind drifts towards God at the 2, 3, 4 o'clock in the morning hours. Okay? Okay? We already discussed this. But this is what I'm talking about when you fall in love with the Lord. When you want Him badly. When you do your life with Him. You know, St. Thomas of Aquinas, he's considered the greatest theologian of all time. He wrote volumes of theology books, and he wrote the Latin Vulgate version of the Bible that was used for almost a thousand years. So this guy is the scholar of scholars. And then one day, he had an experience with God, and he never wrote another thing. He moved from intellectual to experiential, kind of like Job. I heard about you with the ear, but now I've seen you. That's what I'm talking about right here, right now for us. Fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of your faith. And I think you're going to learn some wonderful things about who God is. And you're going to see His beauty starting to show up in your life. You're going to experience His grace like you never did before. And other people are going to notice. What happened? To, where are you going to church? Because whatever's happening there, yeah. They're going to say, I want it or I'm going to stay away from your church. One of the two, okay? Reminds me of the man went to the travel agent and said, you know, I'm looking for something extraordinary. And the travel agent says, well, we've got a cruise around the world that stops at every wonder of the world. He goes, what else you got? Well, we have a submarine that's going to take you throughout the globe to the best spots for, you know, scuba diving. Anything else? Well, we got this one particular flight that's going to go out into space, and you'll be able to see the universe, like only a few people have. He goes, is that the best you can do? Here's the deal. When you have entered into that intimate place with God, eh, nothing's going to compare. And you got to see the stars a little bit better. And you got to go to some fun places. But there's nothing like when you and him get together and touch souls. Moses asked, can I see you? David said, the one thing that I will seek, that I might gaze upon the Lord and talk to Him. Amen?